Hello, I'm Steve Barron. Even though our documentary, New Zealand's Democratic Deficit, exposed a lack of real democracy in New Zealand, and even though we explain why New Zealand needs binding referendums in our second video, some people still have concerns, many of them unfounded. So today we'll be discussing many of the common objections people raise about direct democracy and binding referendums, with our panel of experts from around the world, as well as from several well-known New Zealand politicians. But first of all, let me introduce our panel to you. Professor Matt Courtrip lectures at Cranfield University in the United Kingdom and is the author of A Comparative Study of Referendums. He's also recently published the book Direct Democracy. He's been described by the BBC as the world's leading expert on referendums and direct democracy and has advised both the United Nations and the US State Department on the subject. Professor John Matsusaka is the Charles F. Sexton Chair in American Enterprise at the Marshall School of Business, Gould School of Law and Department of Political Science at the University of Southern California. He's also Executive Director of the Initiative and Referendum Institute. He served as a consultant for the White House Council of Economic Advisers and is author of the book, For the Many or the Few. Professor Sean Bowler is an American expert on initiatives and referendums. He's the Associate Dean of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at the University of California, Riverside, and the author of Demanding Choices, Opinion Voting and Direct Democracy with Todd Donovan. Mr. Bruno Kaufman is the first director of the Initiative and Referendum Institute Europe. He is a journalist for the Swiss Broadcasting Company. Mr. Kaufman has served as an expert for numerous national governments and international organisations, including the European Union, the German Parliament and the Council of Europe. Mr. Kaufman has authored and edited numerous books on modern direct democracy, including the Guidebook to Direct Democracy, which has been published in nine languages, as well as the Initiative for Europe Handbook series on the emergence of the European Citizens' Initiatives. Mr. Nigel Smith was, was chairman of the cross-party Yes campaign in the Scottish devolution referendum in 1997, advisor for the Yes campaign in the Northern Ireland referendum in 1998, and also chaired the London-based cross-party United Kingdom No Euro referendum campaign from 2002. Mr. Winston Peters is leader of the New Zealand First Party. He is a former National Party Cabinet Minister, Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer from 1996 to 1998. Mr. Colin Craig is a businessman, organiser of the 2009 Queen Street March for Democracy, a former Auckland mayoral candidate and now leader of the New Zealand Conservative Party. Mr. Larry Baldock is a former United Future Party Member of Parliament and Tauranga City Councillor. In 2009, he headed the successful Smacking Referendum campaign along with Cheryl Saville. We have a referendum every three years when we elect Members of Parliament to represent us. Why do we need referendums and why not simply let the professionals do their jobs? Well, I think it's because they sometimes run away and they do what they're not supposed to be doing. In Britain, for example, we have a party called the Liberal the leader of that party actually signed, literally signed, a pledge that he would not put up tuition fees for universities. Then when he comes in, he triples them. Uh, so he's actually literally gone against his, his own word. Now, people cannot do anything. And then, you know, come the election time, next time around, there's no way they can, they can hold him to account. I mean, they can boot him out, but it's way too late. If you have mechanisms for direct democracy, like they have in Switzerland, uh, or in Uruguay, or in certain American states, then the people can gather signatures before that law comes into play, before that law is enacted or is given royal assent. So it gives the people a chance to, to basically veto legislation by politicians who have, well, frankly, lied about what they were going to do. So it's because you can't always trust politicians, you need to have um, a mechanism that can hold them to account. That's why we need referendum. Because an election is not really a referendum in the context that you're putting this 
the specific question with clarity, with a proper debate, with a uh, question that is capable of certainty, is put to the people. Now that is what you might call a substantive democratic process on which there can be no misinterpretation in a general election vote. That is not the case. The government will say, well, we have a majority in Parliament that supports, and, and, and that means a majority in Parliament means a majority of the public, support this issue. Well, that's hogwash. Often the election comes down to who the public think are best able to manage the economy. They may not like their defence, their social and other programs, education program, but they will vote on that issue. So the statement that they're identical, referendum and an election, is not true. The 1986 New Zealand Royal Commission on the Electoral System didn't recommend referendums. In fact, they went as far to say that initiatives and referenda are blunt and crude devices which need to be used with care and circumspection. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I agree they need to be used with care and circumspection. Uh, and look, I, I think we accept that the one failing of referendums is they do have to be blunt. They have to be a simple question. So we accept that, you know, not everything about them is 100% perfect. But what we're saying is it's better to have something of a safeguard there than it is to simply give politicians who won't always keep their promises um, free reign to do what they wish to do. The public need more ownership of the political process than that. So I, I agree with that statement. Yes, they can be a little bit blunt. And we do need to use them with care and, and, and circumspect in a circumspect way. But I believe we have. If you look at it, you know, five referendums is hardly breaking the bank in over 20 years. So for me, I look at it, I think we have used them carefully and circumspectly. I don't think the process has ever really been abused at all. Uh, so for me, I, th I think that we've kept that recommendation, and that recommendation is in play. I note that we didn't follow the recommendations of the Royal Commission in respect of other things like party threshold or whether or not there should be Maori seats. So I wonder, the people who go back to that and draw on that, oh, my first question is, well, we've kind of kept to that little bit of the Royal Commission. What about the things we blatantly ignored? Why don't we bring those into play? And I think we should start there rather than over-analyzing whether every referendum has had enough circumspect behavior, uh, but I would argue they have. Well, I thought that was a weakness in, in their otherwise quite decent report. Um, it's clearly a pejorative statement, and it can't even be uh, accepted as a reasonable assessment of the many thousands of referendums that have been held in the Western democracies. But let's, um, let's, uh, there's also that element that it is a sort of top-down process which government may use this referendum process or it may not, that it's therefore a tool of government when actually it's a tool of the people. So, but let's just uh, deal with uh, the specifics. Blunt and crude, well, you could say it's simple and obvious. And therein, I think, lies the merit of a referendum, that uh, there's no need to call it blunt. It's simple. Uh, there's no need to call it crude, uh, if that means that it's obvious to the voters what they're voting on and uh, the nature of the decision that they're taking. So even, even if I give uh, the Commission the benefit of the doubt, I think their statement is wholly pejorative. I think most of the work of that Commission was extraordinarily uh, good and of a very, very high standard. But I do not think that recommendation or that comment by them fits that description of being of high standard. I think they are plainly wrong, and I do not think that the people who were on that Commission thought in uh, uh, the, uh, how shall I put it, a more internationalist way and looked, and looked at the referenda process offshore, nor did they see it in our future. With the new technology that was coming in, it wasn't quite here then, back in 86, that you could, with online processes and what have you, ha have very successful 
simple referenda questions put to the public at a minimal uh, of inconvenience and cost. Now, I don't think they understood, they understood that, and so I don't agree with them. It's often said that voters aren't competent enough to make good decisions in a referendum and that they don't have the in-depth information that members of parliament have at their disposal. What are your thoughts, thoughts on that? I think that's nonsense. I mean, there are, there are two ways of looking at this. Uh, one is if you ask just the sort of the regular parliamentarian about the whole bunch of issues that they voted on, they won't be able to tell you the details either. I think it's this idea that uh, legislators know a lot. It is just a lot more than voters all the time on every issue. It just isn't true. I mean, I can qualify that in a minute, but, but, but that's, that's gracefully overstated. But the other way is, the other thing is, is that the idea that voters are too, basically, too stupid to vote is just nonsense too. I mean, survey after survey, voters kind of know what they want. Uh, they know which way to vote. They know what uh, they, which way they think the country should be going. Um, uh, on, on a whole range of issues that oftentimes they're not that hard to figure out. Now, having said both those points, it is true that legislators do do a, a, a vital job and they do perform a vital service in, in trying to consider especially very technical details and, and lots of those details, it's true, are lost on, on voters or maybe they, after a second thought, voters would go for it. But by and large, voters know what they want to vote for they know just as well as uh, as MPs what they want to vote for, and so should be given the chance to vote on it. Higher to sort of, you know, fix your teeth when you go to the dentist, or fix your plumbing, or fix your lights when you've got an electrical problem, or drive a car on the freeway next to you. I mean, you trust them to do all those things, but you don't trust them with a the vote. It's, it's just um, astonishing to me how little faith we have in each other. I mean, if you believe people were as dumb as you think voters are, you know, if you have that view that voters are too dumb, you just wouldn't leave the house in the morning because you'd be so frightened of something that would happen to you. Well, that is an excuse for anti-democratic behaviour. The fact is that the public have as much capacity on issues of substance, if the question is directly put, to decide that issue. And they have as much experience, in fact, far more experience, uh, in, than members of parliament. And a lesser likelihood of having their decision-making processes contaminated as parliamentarians have by all sorts of outside extraneous influences, such as, when well, you don't vote for that, you won't be in cabinet. And not very democratic behaviour that is, and whereas the public cannot be bought that way. Opponents often argue that referendums would be a tyranny of the majority, harming minorities and reducing civil rights. How would you answer this concern? I think our experience in New Zealand over the last 15 years has been the tyranny of the minority, where a minority of a, a liberal uh, elite in Wellington have been pushing their agenda through, uh, which has been overwhelmingly uh, against the will of the majority of New Zealanders. So I think the referendum bring a balance into it. If there are issues about minorities and, and human rights, then those things can be uh, introduced into the legislation so that on certain key issues, particularly if they're you know, a breach of human rights or there are major constitutional change, there can be some other safeguards put in place. Well, I think that those opponents probably would benefit from opening a history book. History shows that the real tyranny is normally visited by despots, by dictators, by governments who gain totalitarian control. Uh, and if I look at the major civil rights movements around the world, what I see is that they began with the people. It was the politicians who were last to the cause. And I, I think that this is a very flawed argument, actually. I think history shows that uh, people as a group are actually far more measured um, around these sorts of issues. It's people as a group who lobby for... Um, minority rights, and I think the history shows us very clearly you're much safer to put this sort of thing in the hands of the people rather than in the hands of a few. But what about mob rule, Colin?
again, I would say I don't believe that there, you've got any sort of substantial record and refereeing anywhere in the world to so show that mobs somehow are going to come in and dictate to some small hard done by minority. I mean, a demo, in a democracy, we do accept that the majority will have their say. That's what a democracy is, essentially. It boils down to people having votes and deciding things through a discussion and through a forum where hopefully everyone engages intelligently. Now, I would argue that uh, a public discussion is a far more intelligent debate than one held in the House of Representatives, usually under a lot of time pressure. Uh, and, and very often by people who haven't had time even to read the paperwork of what they're voting on. I think public discussions are very healthy, and I think that they actually temper those with very strong opinions in society because they're, they're public discussions and it gives a chance for people to think clearly about things. I think if you look at, the, again, look at the track record, the countries that have more referenda that have more involvement of the people have normally the best record in terms of how their people are treated, in terms of civil rights. And and I, I think I think it's a stretch to say, look, the vast majority of people in society will do harm, but a small group of elite behind closed doors won't. Look, history shows every time it's the small group who have more power than they should, who caused the problem. So I, I think this is a simple case of opening history books. People often refer to Proposition 13 in California and suggest that it's ruined California and made it impossible to balance the budget. Is that the case? Proposition 13 in California is probably the best known proposition across the globe from 1978. And what happened, what happened with Proposition 13 is that property prices had been uh, rising by dramatic rates, uh, but property tax rates were held constant. So you had a lot of people, say retired individuals, who had fixed incomes, uh, but their property taxes were skyrocketing because through no fault of their own, the, uh, the values of their homes were going up. So they revolted, as they say, in 1978. And they said, look, there's a maximum amount of property taxes that anybody can, can pay. Um, now, that law, of course, constrained the, the government, and the government had to find other revenue sources and, and so forth. Uh, but uh, it remains popular within the state of California now, some odd 30, 30 years later. It's sometimes a convenient whipping boy for anybody who, who doesn't like uh, 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 the way government's going, that particularly those who want to have a spending program uh, that isn't being funded by the government, they, it's convenient to blame Proposition 13 to say, well, the money's not there because of Proposition 13. Uh, but the truth is the state has, has plenty of money to spend. Uh, the state spends a lot of money, uh, and uh, the state uh, has plenty of tools to balance its budget. Uh, there's, there's very few restrictions on the spending side, so the state can balance its budget by cutting spending. There's plenty of other revenue sources as well, uh, personal income tax, sales taxes, and, and so forth. Uh, so. So the, the idea that Proposition 13 has somehow made the state ungovernable um, is just un, untenable. Uh, there's many, many years that the state's been perfectly fine balancing its budget, including uh, including some, some very recent years. So th I think that's more of a story or a whipping boy for people that don't like the, the fact that government spending was restrained a bit by Proposition 13 than a reflection of actual fact. No, I mean, it's made things a little difficult in some ways, but... Um, there, there are two things. One is there's a lot of studies on this, and, and Berkeley, UC Berkeley, has a great website of information on this for people who want to know more than more than is decent about marrying around this. Um, it did change revenue gathering in the state. It changed how the state financed education and its relationship to to local government. So it did change a lot of things. But the fundamental fact is uh, of it is that. People during the 1970s were asked to pay taxes, an increasing amounts of ta taxes, uh, at a time when the state was running huge budget services and it wasn't clear to voters what they, the money was being spent on. And so voters quite reasonably said, hold on a minute, if you, you don't tax us so much. And now we could argue about the relative balance between services and taxes and you know, I work in the public sector, so I'm okay with uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm kind of a tax and spend person too, just by nature of my job, in, in a sense. But still, it's reasonable when you're talking about voters being taxed as, that voters are confident uh, that their money is being spent wisely or on things that they want to do so. And Prop 13 was a sign that they, they didn't have that confidence. Now we see a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a U-turn on voters' part, that they are more willing to give taxes and be taxed for if they think it's if they think the tax is legitimate. It, it, it's a fairly sensible kind of position that voters have. Or, or another way, or maybe a shorter way of putting it is, politicians did not always make the case to voters that their tax money was being spent wisely and so being raised wisely. A lot of people criticise direct democracy and criticising the voters per se. And, and my first point is, well, they don't say that about elections generally. These are the same people voting in governments, voting in the European Parliament we saw in, in, in Europe recently. Um, so the criticisms people make about voters and direct democracy could equally be applied to voters at election time, and we wouldn't even think of doing away with elections. So we do have to kind of moderate the criticisms we make of voters time after time. That they're, they're overstated, they, they're not borne out by the empirical evidence. So we do really have to, to, to watch that one. Unlike the, the parliamentary process, it's argued that referendums don't allow for compromise. The blunt yes or no instruments, even though they are on specific issues. How would you respond to this? When it comes to voting on a referendum, it's true that you have to vote yes or, or no on it, and there's no, it's beyond the point where, where you can have a discussion. Um, but that's true, frankly, as well when the legislature votes. At some point, a decision has to be made on the option that's before you and you have to go yes or, or no on it. Before the initiative happens, though, there's very typically a tremendous amount of negotiation. Typically, sponsors will go to the legislature, uh, uh, the government beforehand, and say, here's an issue that we're concerned about. Can we work something out? Votes typically don't want to uh, initiate uh, uh, in referendums uh, unless they can't get some sort of um, action from, from the government it's, itself because it's very expensive to do it. So, so there's a... Uh, there's a, there's a there's a period where compromise can happen uh, beforehand. Often there's multiple groups that are interested in sponsoring a measure, and they may have a discussion amongst themselves and come out with something that they, that they believe uh, meets their needs. Uh, in, in larger states or when a campaign has money, there will be some, some, um, some vetting with focus groups and so forth to try to understand uh, what the voters want. So, so there's a process before the, before the measure actually comes to a vote where there's plenty of opportunities to fine-tune and change it. Um, but of course, when you vote on something, you have to vote on what's on what's before you. First of all, the, the that comment is made obviously without a, a any culture of referendums. If you have a culture of referendums, for example, uh, uh, most obviously in Switzerland, then before you even get to a referendum, there is an element of, of uh, compromise in the parliamentary process, uh, which they call referendum proofing, in an attempt to, to build up towards a consensus. And similarly in Scotland, um, at the moment we can see that the debate is, uh, the debate is setting up uh, possible outcomes after the referendum that would be called compromises. So uh, I think this is not a far-sighted enough comment. Uh, they are simple instruments, but they do have a place in a modern democracy. And I would go as far as to say they can enrich a representative democracy. Well, I think in Switzerland, for example, they have a mechanism which is called a counter-proposal. So Parliament, if it has passed a law that people don't like, we can, Parliament can put forward a compromise bill, which will then be voted on. So in, in some ways, the places where they have the most direct democracy, most referendums, they actually have mechanisms for consensus. It also ensures a consensus between the elite and the people. So if you take Switzerland as an example, that Switzerland is known as a consensus democracy or Concordance Democratie in that language, uh, which is basically a system which is, you know, designed to ensure consensus, not just consensus between the people, which you have 
by you know often getting putting forward compromise bills, but also consensus between the elites uh, and the people who, who, who elect them. So countries that have a lot of referendums also tend to be countries where you have compromise. There are relatively few referendums, Britain, where we have a majoritarian political system, where whoever has a majority in Parliament, not necessarily more people, can you know ram anything through Parliament. Other countries in, in Europe, for example, Denmark, have many political parties. They have a consensus system of government, and they often have referendums. Opponents suggest we'd be having referendums every day of the week. How can we possibly run a country by having a referendum on every decision Parliament need, needs to make? The experience of most cities or states or countries that use referendums is they don't do them very often. Uh, I think most people, even those who are strong proponents of direct democracy, don't believe that it makes sense to have voters regularly deciding uh, issue after issue after issue. Uh, most voters, in fact, don't want to decide issue after issue after issue. They want the elected officials to do their job and decide most of the issues. I think the better way to think of initiative and referendums is their safety valve. There's something that you don't really want to use, but there may be instances when it's right to use it. There may be instances when there's some, there's just some complicated issues where, uh, where you really want to get a sense of the community. Uh, it's something that might come down to, to community values. Those could be things about, um, marriage laws, perhaps, um, uh, um, forms of punishment, for example, capital punishment. Um, the, you know, the, these these get into issues where where some countries or, or or cities or states might think that those are community values issues to be need to be decided, um, not by a small group of people, but by a handpick of you know a small group of representatives, but by the people themselves. Um, there's also the issues where the representatives just don't just don't do what they should be doing uh, again because they're unduly influenced by things they shouldn't be influenced on, and and the direct democracy is just a way to the people to reassert their their rights uh, in a democracy to 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 get the policies they want when elected officials won't do what they want. But again, it, 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 I think it's not. I don't think many people would view direct democracy as a substitute for representative government. I think it's, it's properly viewed as an add-on. It's something that you would supplement your existing representative institution to provide safety valves and to, uh, and to provide some options just in case those institutions don't do, uh, don't do an ideal job. Well, this is a wonderful criticism uh, by taking um, a proposition to its extremes. It, it, it really is no nonsense. Nobody is suggesting that we do this. Uh, and even in uh, countries like Switzerland or, or uh, California, where they make extensive use of referendums, a tiny fraction of the um, legislative decisions are made by referendum. The significance is that they may have been controversial issues, big issues, or constitutional issues, but they still only represent four, five, six percent of the decisions in a year. So no, no part of the world gets remotely near this situation, so I would dismiss it. It's a common belief that the public are irresponsible and will only support referendums that promise short-term benefits without considering the long-term costs. How do you see this? Well, look, again, I would suggest that um, politicians have not proved that they're any more responsible than the rest of us. And in fact, I think there's a very good argument to say that more than anyone else, they are driven by very short-term considerations, i.e., am I going to get back into office three years from now? Now, I believe the public don't have that pressure on them. They're not looking to get elected three years from now. And therefore, I actually think that their decision-making and their consideration is actually much better structured um, and actually takes into account the long term far better than a politician who's got to think about getting re-elected in two, three years' time. So, look, I, I think, again, I think that's a slight on the public. I think the public have proven that they're very measured. Um, the discussions around referendum that we have in this country have been um, very good. They've been very robust, and I think the discussion has looked long-term. Uh, in fact, I would argue the public discussions 
around referenda in this country have always looked long term and asked long term questions. Whereas I think a lot of government policy and what government has enacted clearly does not. And we've seen examples of, you know, things rushed through just before an election to give the government support. Um, no, you know, cancelling interest on student loans was one of those. I introduced it in an election campaign to get somebody through. No thought of the long term. No thought that we would have billions and billions of dollars of uncollectible debt because there's no interest on it. No thought of whether it was actually fair to give a interest-free loan to somebody studying sociology at a university, but we won't do anything to help someone wanting an apprenticeship or starting a small business as a plumber say. So I think we can, we again, if we look at the history of it, we get long-term and much broader discussions in a public debate when an issue is decided by the public than we ever do when the politicians are making the decisions by themselves. Behind. Well, I think it's empirically wrong. We have examples of, of people where they have voted for lower taxes and higher spending, of course, and then they learn their lesson. In California, for example, we've had, which is one of the places where they use direct democracy and referendum most frequently, we've had in, in recent years several examples of tax increases through referendum. Because we, when you give responsibility to people, they become responsible. They know that it's, it's their taxes, it's their political system. And you give the people the ownership of their own government, uh, and then they, they act accordingly, they act responsibly. So the empirical evidence is that people actually learn to behave better if they're given the responsibility to, to, uh, to have an influence over their own laws. That's again, as usually the excuse of penal self-serving egregious politicians who want to have their way, even though it can be an enormous damage to the country. Bear in mind this, that the wider use of referenda would, I think, take us to a four-year term, which the public would vote for, and give governments greater ability to govern, if they had that more, that better checks and balance process, which referenda can be. So, you know, there are serious benefits here. But to the, for the idea that the public are bloody minded not to be trusted, well, then why do we hold elections? People have a fear that, that special interest groups, wealthy individuals and the media will always decide the outcome of referendums. Are these fears warranted? I would say yes and no. When it comes to influencing a decision, of course, interests and organized and well-funded interests always have a chance to make their voices maybe better heard in the debate than others, and money do play a role. But this problem is, of course, not limited to referendums. It's also exactly the same in, ele in election time. On the other side, when you uh, look into the possibility of, of having a, a say in a vote by every individual, of course, this limits a little bit the influence of the special interests if you compare to a situation where only the lobbyists have an influence on those who make the decisions, for instance, in government. So I would say referendums makes the influence of the special interests more limited than if you don't have referendums. I don't think they are. In fact, the referendum was introduced, in, especially in America, to limit the influence of special interest groups and lobbyists. And if you think of it sort of, you know, just straightforwardly in, in practical terms, then it's very easy for a lobbyist to hoodwink um, or lobby uh, a, a small number of parliamentarians, a handful of politicians, and give them sweeteners for voting for bills. It's pretty impossible. To, uh, to bribe the whole electorate. Um, so if you look at it uh, in, in those terms, then that becomes pretty much impossible. You've also seen many examples of referendums where the people have voted in favour of or against things that the elites, the press, uh, all the ones that the powers that be actually have supported. We have seen examples in Ireland where all the political parties, the press, um, the interest groups, the trade unions, the employers' organisations were in favour of more European integration, whereas the people were, were opposed to it, and the people prevailed, they voted no regardless. Uh, and then there was a compromise they could live with. So the referendum, contrary to, to the myth, uh, actually allows people to, to, to vote no or vote yes, and to disagree with their electorate.
pictures. And people are stupid. You know, people can, once they've weighed up the, the consequences, well, if they're not too many referendums at the same time, they will be able to uh, to make decisions that are approximately uh, identical to their belief system. Opponents suggest that money will always buy a referendum. Is that the case? Well, again, I think, look, let's simply look at the history of referenda. Uh, that's not true. Um, and California had one on marriage, right? Whether or not they would um, allow same-sex marriage. And it went to referendum. Uh, those supporting the change um, outspent those opposing the change, I think, by 10 to 1. And they literally spent billions. I mean, it was massive campaigns. Um, and, and they didn't succeed. The people of California voted to keep marriage between a man and a woman. So, look, there was a, more money than any other referendum that I know of uh, was spent on that particular campaign to try to change the public's mind. The public did not uh, change their mind. They decided they wanted to keep marriage the way it was. So I think an argument that says, well, money buys a referendum simply ignores the facts. The facts show that money doesn't buy a referendum. Good arguments might. Good debate might. Um, carefully building your case might, but I think those are all positive things in a, in a democratic country. I think that good debate, good arguments deserve to win the day, uh, but I would say very clearly history shows money just simply isn't enough to give. It's absolutely not the case that money will buy a referendum outcome. There are many, many instances where the side that spent the most money loses it's not at all uncommon. So that's that's completely a, an incorrect statement. What is correct is that money plays a role. Uh, there is plenty of evidence that suggests that if you have money, uh, your if you have money, you can get out your argument and reach the people that are um, open to that argument. You're going to get them to be more likely to vote and more likely to to show up to the polls. So it's very clear that money helps you get your message out and helps you activate your supporters and can help you get more votes. But if you, if you don't have an, an issue that people are receptive to, no matter how much money you spend, uh, they're not going to vote. They're not going to vote in, 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 in your way. So there's a limit to what, to what money can do. People are sometimes uncomfortable with the notion that money plays a role uh, in, in ballot proposition ele elections. Uh, and I think we should all be a little bit concerned about money. In, in particular, we don't want it to play too much of a role. But at the same time, we have to recognize that money plays a role in, in representative democracy as well. Uh, there's, there's really no form of democracy where, where money and campaigning doesn't, doesn't play some sort of role. So, so that's just part of the system. That's part of the world that you get when you do, when you do democracy. People, people that have money uh, who can get out their arguments are, 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 are likely to find uh, themselves a little more effective. So, so I, I don't think that's a, that's a problem that's unique to direct democracy. That's, that's just part of democracy. I think the answer is just to, to manage it and to make sure that all sides get to get their views out in public uh, and so that the voters get to hear uh, all the different sides and come to an informed decision when you vote. A referendum is estimated to cost around $10 million in New Zealand. Aren't referendums really too expensive? And how could you justify this cost when it could be spent on more hospital operations, for example? Well, first of all, one of the reasons why they estimate it costs around $10 million, is, is really postage. It's a major part of the expense of a postal referendum. Uh, and in my opinion, referendum should be held at elections, uh, particularly local body elections and the uh, parliamentary elections, and that significantly reduces the cost. If we took the postal element out of it, uh, it's actually a reasonable cost for a, a strong democracy. And given that, of course, New Zealand Post at the moment is still owned by the government and the people of New Zealand, the profits that they benefit from uh, go back to the government in, in dividends. So I think the expense is, is, is overstated and actually, but at the end of the day, whatever it costs, to have a strong democracy is worthwhile. Well, first of all, uh, once every three years, it would be in tandem with the general election, so there would be no additional cost at all. Firstly, no. The other two years, if referenda did get up on the uh, 1st of March, that is with the 
a 10% threshold covered, and then you would have the long debate into the 1st of November, or thereabouts the Saturday of that near that date for the referendum, yes, there would be a cost. But it would be less than half the cost of the Nova Pay botcher. And what price do you put on democracy? Look, this is an often cited reason against referendums. Uh, but what cost democracy? Uh, what, what cost is it? Uh, what, you know, how worthwhile is it to have a government that truly reflects what the people of the country want? And I remember asking the Swiss ambassador about the cost of referendum in Switzerland, because of course they have quite a few. Uh, and she said, who in Switzerland cares about the cost? It's about having a country that they feel they own, that they feel they can participate in, and knowing that the decisions have been well thought through, well debated, and genuinely reflect the public's best interest. And I think we need to adopt that attitude. I mean, we waste money on all sorts of other things all the time, and that's acceptable. I think this is not a waste of money. I think it goes to the heart of government. It goes to the heart of building a country uh, where we have, in a mature way, talked about things in a public forum. And so for me, I see this as money very well spent. There's justifiably plenty of negative publicity in New Zealand, which has highlighted the poor wording of referendums, with some referendum questions being leading and ambiguous. How could this problem be overcome? By using plain, common sense English that is unambiguous, that is understandable. And the current referenda running right now on the asset sales is very direct and simply put. It, it cannot be misunderstood. Are you for the sale of these SOEs or aren't you? Yes or no? That's pretty direct. But I do admit that there, that there may have been times where the quality of the question, given the range of public servants and academia who were involved, led a lot to be desired. Yeah, obviously the question and any sort of proposition or any sort of referendum is very important. Uh, what the Conservative Party has as policy is that referendum questions must be worded in the simple form and in the positive. So that way if you support the proposal then you vote yes, uh, if you don't support it then you vote no. That just keeps it nice and clear and simple. However, having said that, uh, and although some of our questions haven't been ideal, it's very clear the public did understand them. I mean, nobody's got up afterwards and said, oh, by golly, I voted the wrong way because the question was confusing. By the time you've had a public debate, people do understand what it's about. They do understand whether they want to vote yes or they want to vote no. So, look, I, I think while we need to tidy up the questions, nonetheless, uh, people have understood them. Once there's a debate, once there's a discussion going on, people get it. I mean, again, I, I just reject this idea that the public is somehow extremely dense and the politicians are somehow rather brilliant. It's often argued that referendums can slow the political process and disrupt the government's overall strategy. Wouldn't that be bad for society? Well, that assumes that the overall strategy is sort of bulletproof, one that can never, ever be wrong. And in most cases, governments are not, they don't know everything. Sometimes it's good that they, they pause to think. Uh, in some countries, they uh, said that it would be impossible to, to have any kind of energy policy without nuclear power. That was in Sweden in the early, in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and the, the people in Sweden weren't terribly keen on uh, on nuclear power and nuclear energy. Uh, so there was a referendum that basically stopped that in its tracks, and the Swedes and the Swedish government, of course, find a different way of dealing, dealing with it. Similarly, in Uruguay in, um, in early, the early 90s, uh, the IMF said that you have to introduce these austerity measures, your economy is going to go bankrupt, you have to follow a neoliberal economic uh, political philosophy. The people at Uruguay weren't, weren't convinced by that, so they voted no to that. And of course, Uruguay has done pretty, pretty splendidly ever since, because the, the people sort of said, "Well, hey, wait a minute, you've gone too far, and we don't like that." So the, the power to say no, which essentially is what the referendum, as opposed to the initiative, is all about, 
power to stop governments in their tracks have, have not necessarily, in fact, rarely uh, disrupted the overall governability of a society and sometimes it actually made it better. I don't think that's the case, that they do slow things down. Certainly not in the US where you have these very many divisions between checks and balance and so on. And oftentimes the, the whole system of government is designed, in here at least, is designed not to move very fast. And so in that sense, um, initiatives can actually prod things along and move them faster than they otherwise would. The, the other one is, you know, this idea that there's an ideal tempo of government. I, I don't know what that is or how we would tell it. But uh, what I do think is the case is that, in principle, direct democracy can kind of unblock government when it's moving too slow. It's true that you, you can derail government. I'm, I'm thinking the nearest that you get to kind of derailing government plans might be the European referendum. We saw in a couple of countries, Ireland, for example, a referendum on the European process and, and voters put the brakes on. And so the governments had all these plans for greater integration and so on and so forth. And voters had this, hold on a minute, we're not ready to go there yet. So they can throw a span in the works, it's true. That they, they can do that. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's their government. There's some concern that direct democracy removes the need for political parties and weakens democracy. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the country in the world that has the, the most direct democracy is Switzerland, and it certainly hasn't removed the need for political parties there, uh, nor has it weakened their, their nation or their democracy. It brings a balance to political parties. It allows, um, allows them to engage in the process when they wish to, and also the average citizen to have their say um, or their views heard properly in, in the democratic process. Well, I think actually there was a, an opinion poll in New Zealand that suggested that people's distrust in politics went down after the introduction of, uh, of the Citizens' Initiative. Um, now, mechanisms, even if they're quite weak, sometimes have the effect of, of actually strengthening democracy. And referendums and initiatives is not, is not a, a, an alternative to democracy. Even in Switzerland and California, which are massive users of the referendum, it's well over 90% percent of all legislation is passed by Parliament. I mean, people are not involved in politics all the time, but it's a break on change, you should say, a, 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 a last resort if you, if you don't like what the government is doing, that, that you can resort to that. So it's a way of making sure that the party system of government actually works. Uh, there's a Swedish study that shows that voters agree with approximately 80% of what the, the parties they vote for um, stand for. Um, but the, the remaining 20% they disagree with, and this allows them to disagree with 20% and agree with, uh, with 80%. So it's a political mechanism for having your cake and eating it. Uh, and in many ways, it actually would strengthen um, party democracy or representative democracy if you have referendums, because you make sure that the political parties are in sync with the people. Well, the first observation, uh, certainly for um, uh, British democracy, is that referendums have actually saved parliamentary and uh, party democracy. Where the parties have been split on an issue, a referendum uh, has allowed them to solve that particular problem. Western democracies are facing some sort of crisis of engagement really quite a long-standing crisis that we had a hundred years in trying to get the full um, uh, universal uh, mandate. We have now begun to look at the quality of our democracy and it seems to me that far from weakening our democracy, incorporating an element of direct democracy in the party structures would, uh, not, not so much the party structures in our representative democracy, would uh, bring back voters uh, to a process that they have really begun to desert significantly. Couldn't radical minorities disrupt society by forcing referendums all the time? Well, there would still be a reasonable threshold to, uh, for the number of signatures that you have to collect. And, and having been involved in collecting 
you know, more than a million signatures on, on about four different citizen-initiated referenda attempts. Um, it's no easy feat. So the idea that a, a few radical minorities might run around and gather all these signatures is, is a little bit farcical, really. It, it requires a broad support from a lot of volunteers in the country to, to ever achieve a referendum. And, and that indicates that there is broad support for the issue being raised. So I, I don't see that as being a great threat. But look, if, if a group can collect the signatures, it still is put to the people of New Zealand, and the majority of New Zealanders have to agree with the question that is put to them. So I can't see the risk there at all. I don't think so, because a referendum process uh, normally isn't a quick fix. It's not a fast track to a, a public debate or a decision. Normally it takes quite some time, and radical ideas may be surfaced by a citizen initiative but before it comes to a decision, that will take time. And during this time, the radicality of certain issues will be, have to be balanced with different voices, different debates. So in the, in the end, uh, uh, a radical uh, groups may not profit of a referendum process, but be more be tested. So their views have to be tested against other solutions. So I don't think this is a real fear, but it depends a little bit on the process as such, how it is designed, how much time, for instance, do you have for gathering signatures, and how much time does it take after you have delivered your signatures until there is a vote. Don't referendums favour one side of the political divide, the left or the right? People sometimes think that referendums are... are uh, tools of, of the far right or, or, or tools of the far left. Um, but, but the truth is, if you study you know, more than 100 years of, of voting on ballot propositions, is that what, what ballot propositions, propositions do is they favor the groups that are not in power. Uh, and what that means is that if you, you have, if you have a city or a state or a country where the, uh, the right is in power, What's going to happen is you're going to see uh, left or progressive groups using the initiative. If you have a city, state, or a country where the left is in power, you're going to see conservative or right uh, right wing groups using the initiative. It, it's basically a tool for 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 individuals who are not currently in power to get their views out out, out in front of the public. So you'll see, for example, in the United in the United States, you'll see that in the 70s and 80s, the initiative was a very uh, favorite tool by um, anti-tax groups, and that's because the governments in, in, in many parts of the country were, were dominated by pro-spending groups. But if you go back farther in the country's history to the early 20th century, uh, that was a period when anti-spending uh, groups were in control of the government, and you saw the initiatives being used by, by progressive groups to bring about uh, social insurance programs and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's, much, it's very much situational. It's, it's just a tool for, for groups that are out of power to get their issues before the public. And even if you look in the last few years uh, within, say, the, the United States, you'll see, you'll see anti-tax groups putting measures on the ballot. You'll see uh, groups that, that would like to define marriage uh, to be only between uh, a man and a woman, that is, who are, who are not in favor of same-sex marriage. You'll see them promoting their issue. At the same time, you'll see, you'll see left-wing groups who are, who are for marijuana legalization or who are for expanded animal rights, uh, who are promoting initiatives as well and, and finding success. So if, if you actually look at what, what happens, you'll see that it's across the spectrum, uh, but the common theme is that it's groups that really don't have the year of the legislature right now that tend to use, to use ballot propositions. And the, the, fact, the, fact that, the fact that the initiative provides an avenue for groups that aren't in power or don't of the year of the legislature, I think is a very healthy part of the process because it can often, it can often happen that the people in power, uh, they talk to each other, they're often from the same social groups, they, they, might, they might miss out on something that's happening uh, amongst the voters uh, and, and just kind of develop a 10-year, and, and sometimes the initiative process is a way, is a way for, for people to say, you know what, there's this issue you guys, you guys aren't even paying attention to that maybe we actually care a lot about. And one example I would give Recently in the United States, it is marijuana legalization, which is an issue where neither party has wanted to touch that issue. Uh, both parties were very strongly against marijuana legalization, and they thought that the voters were very strongly against marijuana legalization. 
because the voters for many, many years have been against marijuana legalization. But what we've seen happen in the last couple of years alone is that the voters have changed their minds. Uh, the voters are now saying, you know what, we don't mind legalizing marijuana in a particularly controlled way. And I think this came as a big shock to a lot of legislators as they saw voters start to approve these things. The feedback effect from this will be that now legislatures on their own will start looking more carefully into this issue, going back to their districts and asking their constituents, you know, what do you guys really want to have happen here? And it may well lead to a change in policy across the country. So I'm not saying that the policy itself is, is good or bad, but I think in democracy we should all view it as healthy that, that when there's a change of opinion, a change of public opinion, Opinion that, that there's an opportunity for it to get registered and, 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 and reflected in the policies. And I think, I think the initiative provides a somewhat unique and distinctive tool that isn't available if, you, if all you have is representatives. Even though general elections don't have minimum thresholds and turnout requirements, some people feel that referendums should. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think if you have referenda at, at uh, voting times, at polling time days, then you get a very good turnout. <clears throat> there is a risk with post postal referenda where the threshold or the turnout can be low. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, everybody has the opportunity to vote. And if citizens choose not to, they are exercising their democratic right. And the decision still has to be uh, upheld. I mean, we don't say that our local uh, body elections are invalid because we have less than a 50% turnout, and, and unfortunately, they have been the, the turnout has been dropping over the years. But the mayor is still a duly elected mayor, and the councillors are, are, are properly elected. Uh, I think that actually having referenda at local body elections could be very helpful in raising the uh, the turnout actually, because there would be issues as well as the simple election of the, the members uh, of the council. There would be other issues that would draw people to vote. My thoughts are about that democracy are about freedom and about rights. And if you have a democratic process, it should be as free and fair as possible. That means if you have an election process without these thresholds, you can, of course, not establish a referendum process with additional uh, limitations, because that would put this whole process into a bird cage, and the bird wouldn't be able to fly. So we have a safeguard. Uh, the way democracy works is those who don't care and don't bother to turn up and vote don't count. And they really have to accept the decision of those people who do participate in the process. Now, we accept that logic when we elect our government. We accept that logic when we elect our local governments, and many of those are very low turnouts. Uh, so I think it's a consistent and absolutely right to accept the same logic with referendum. In Switzerland, only require either 50,000 or 100,000 signatures to trigger a referendum, whereas in New Zealand, it's 10% of those registered on the electoral roll, which is over 300,000 signatures. In your opinion, is this a reasonable amount? And if not, what would you consider reasonable? Well, I think the 10% is, is far too high. Collecting what, what in effect amounts to about 400,000 signatures uh, in our current population is way too high. In California, they, they do 5% of those who voted for the successful uh, governor in the previous election. And I think that's not a bad uh, level to follow here in New Zealand. If we said you had to collect 5% of those who voted in the previous parliamentary election, I think that would be a, 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 a sufficient threshold to mean you didn't have referenda all the time. Uh, there was a test that there was still reasonable support for it across the country, without it being too onerous. The New Zealand amount is not reasonable, and it was decided at that threshold of 10% by the anti-referendum people in the National Party at the time this policy was drafted. That is, we proposed the pro-referendum people, there were only a handful of us, but we did get our way to get it into the manifesto and it became reality. We proposed 5% uh, and in a significant caucus argument, the uh, Neanderthals won the argument. That's why it's 10. Uh, and sadly, 10 is an enormous number to get and an expensive number to get. And uh, I think it's just too difficult and unreasonable. Hitler held a number of referendums. Doesn't this just prove that referendums lead to demagoguery? Rob Rule? 
no, you don't have to go back 80 years to uh, Hitler's plebiscites about uh, changing the power structure. You can just go back to March 2014 and a vote on the Crimea uh, Peninsula where Putin put an issue on the ballot within a few days. And there was no choice to vote no. There was no choice to really have an alternative. It was only one direction. And this kind of so-called referendums are, of course, a total misuse of the tool. And it depends, again, uh, both elections and referendums, they can be misused by undemocratic rulers. But that doesn't mean that elections and referendums are undemocratic tools as such. It depends who are using them, in which way they are used, and what are the outcomes. Down process where they uh, declare uh, that now the people have a say, but in established democracies, with this direct democracy, like for instance Switzerland, but also many US states, the government would never be able, they don't have the right to put an issue to the vote. It's done by a process, the initiative process, or by legislation that it is said, for instance, international treaties or important decisions about finance, they have to be put there by mandatory vote. So there is a big difference between a proper referendum process and a top-down plebiscite. So Hitler held some referendums, sometimes called uh, plebiscites. I, I don't think I don't think anyone seriously would argue that, that that all the bad things that happened under Hitler, the demagoguery and the Marlboro, I don't think anybody would seriously argue that they happened because he held plebiscites. Because I think any reasonable person understands that plebiscites or not, uh, that was a, that was a very uh, a problematic regime, uh, party, and, and, and leader. So I, I think the notion to suggest that somehow because he held plebiscites, that was the cause of all the bad things that happened in, in Nazi Germany. Um, um, surely that people mean that as a rhetorical argument, not a not not, not a serious argument. Um, but turning to the more serious the serious argument, which is which is well, well, is there a danger of of, of mob rule? Uh, I think there's always a danger in democracy that the majority will not respect the rights of the minority. Um, that's why many uh, democracies build in various forms of checks and balances. They have constitutional provisions which protect rights of, of groups. Um, and you need those. You need those whether you have representatives or, or not. Um, but assuming that those other checks and balances function correctly, in the United States, for example, uh, the judiciary's job partly is to, is to step in and say, no, you guys can't pass these kind of laws because they violate basic rights. As long as your other institutions function correctly, you're, you're at no more risk under direct democracy than under representative democracy. And it's, it's actually an interesting case in point. One of the uh, certainly worst uh, and uh, most terrible episodes in American history was, was disenfranchisement of, of black voters uh, in the Jim Crow era after the Civil War and uh, up till the 1960s or, or so. Um, those We clearly had a significant fraction of our citizens that were deprived of their basic civil rights during that period. Well, that didn't happen through direct democracy. That happened through elected officials in southern states. They went through, they played by all the rules. They got elected fair and square as, as they were defining the system uh, to their own advantage back, back then. But those were purely representative institutions that uh, led to, a, in some sense, a form of mob rule uh, and led to a, a big subset of citizens uh, being deprived of their basic rights. Um, and and, and I, I'm only bringing this up to say that, that all forms of democracy are at risk of, of, of having bad outcomes, uh, uh, direct democracy as well. I'm sure we can point to instances of direct democracy where, where the laws were not what, what, what they should have been. Um, but, but you can't, you can't evaluate forms of democracy by pointing to a particular bad law because they all fail from time to time. What you have to do is you have to look at the, at the system as a whole. And looking as a whole, as, as people have done as a whole, the record of direct democracy when it comes to mob rule or protection of minority rights is is actually fairly good compared to the history of representative institutions. A referendum suitable for all issues. What issues are referendums used for in Switzerland, for example? Um, well, they are used for everything. I mean, pr pretty much anything you can imagine has been the topic of a of, a, of a, an initiative here. Could be drug use. The sale of horse meat for food, the death penalty, uh, insurance rates, um, political reform, gay marriage, all kinds of things here. Uh, there are no limits on what can be um, uh, can be the subject of, of, of an initiative or not. And then that's pretty much the same in Switzerland too. Um, 
they seem to do work better where there are these broader statements of principle for voters, to telling politicians, this is the way we want to go. However, of course, the problem is, is that you can't just say to elected politicians, we want to go this way and expect them to, to follow along. You kind of have to put in place some concrete details, constitutional reforms or limitations that push, uh, that push politicians a particular way or push the political system a particular way. But the kind of, the more, the broader things seem to work better as an expression of popular will. Um, but in very practical terms, I think these sort of quite narrow propositions are the ones that actually stand more chance of being implemented. I mean, the referendum process should be embedded in a, a political uh, uh, constitution which has a clear check and balance structure where certain issues needs a higher, uh, uh, let's say, uh, process than others. In Switzerland, it's very clear that the initiative and referendum process can be used exactly for the same issues as the national parliament or is it the cantal local parliaments can decide about. So there are no differences between what the representatives and those who have elected the representatives can vote about. At the same time, it is important to say that certain issues are defined by international law where Switzerland has signed and there are a, cer a certain amount of exemptions where you cannot by one vote go beyond them or exclude them. So certain issues like torture, death penalty and other issues, they cannot be put to a vote, a single vote. In that way, if you would like to reintroduce torture and the death penalty in Switzerland, you would have to go through different levels of voting and Switzerland would have to uh, resign for international treaties. And that's important, I think, to say that a referendum process is never something like a special track. It's a track within the structure of a polity. Don't referendums usually produce low turnouts, which means only a small part of society is deciding the outcome for the majority of society? No, that's not true. I mean, if you look into the European uh, sphere, you see that referendums on Europe normally have high, uh, much higher threshold uh, turnouts than, for instance, European elections. And in Switzerland, for instance, uh, many uh, uh, referendums have higher threshold, uh, higher turnouts than uh, the parliamentary elections. What is important to say is that if you very often have referendums on issues, like in Switzerland, it's uh, important to say that while the average turnout may be, be around 50%, over one year, more than 80% of the electorate would participate at least in one such vote. And many people also use it in that way. When they feel they are concerned, they are interested, they are well informed, they participate. If they don't feel that, they will leave the vote to the others and not participate. So in the end, it makes the people much more participating, but it's a selective participation. It's a qualitative high participation, which not only refers to quantity, and if you talk about quantity, just see what happened recently in North Korea, where 100% of the voters went to the ballot box. But of course, this has nothing to do with democracy.